My name is Guy Daniels, and I am the microbiome expert. Welcome to another informative presentation on the microbiome. In this presentation, we will cover why the popular low FODMAPS diet is not a great long-term solution. There are many people in books touting the low FODMAPS diet as something to resolve your gut issues, usually framed in the context of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. However, I am not one of them, as we will see. Some of the topics I present in my various webinars, like this one, can be a little controversial because they upset some people's belief systems. But as John Adams said, facts are stubborn things, or in our case, data. I present you with a more intelligent approach, which is mostly the opposite of this diet. But first, briefly, what is the low FODMAPS diet? The acronym FODMAP stands for fermentable, oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyol. So what does all that mean? FODMAPs includes short-chain fermentable carbohydrates such as lactose, fructose, fructans, galactans, and polyalcohols. So what does that mean? FODMAPs is basically a bunch of stuff you consume and is potentially fermentable inside your gut, causing symptoms. There are potential osmotic absorption and rapid fermentation issues with all of these. Let's take the example of lactose, which is a sugar. Now, many of you have heard of lactose intolerance. It's the inability to cleave the bond in this sugar, and via osmosis, water gets drawn into the intestine and you get diarrhea. This is separate from the many protein-based issues from dairy products. Mostly based on the immunostimulatory proteins, I've always said that we should not be consuming dairy products. Therefore, I am in agreement with a part of the low FODMAPS diet the elimination of dairy. And to be honest, the elimination of that one food may resolve a great many issues. Also, if you find that you react to gluten, then avoid it as well. So, if you have IBS and you try a dairy-free, gluten-free diet, then you're off to a great start. You've just removed the two most offensive food groups that we have. But the rest of this diet is a dumb idea, and here's why. Now, first, I'm not saying this diet doesn't work. It does. It alleviates your symptoms. There is plenty of data to prove that. However, it's not a solution. It's symptom treatment. It doesn't resolve the underlying issue. My philosophy is to get to the root cause. Low FODMAPs gets you on a path of food avoidance. The inflamed dysbiotic gut is always going to react to foods. I've seen many people who have drastically limited their foods over the years as they worsen, and at the extreme are left with eating white rice and chicken breast. Low FODMAPs is good in the short term, but in the long term, it's a bad idea. Why? Because other than the fact that it eliminates many of the healthiest foods we know of, it also eliminates the fibers or prebiotics on which your microbiome feeds. On this slide, we're going to consider just two bacteria the two health-promoting bacteria which are most consistently reduced in the low FODMAPs diet, Bifidobacterium and Fecalibacterium prausiciae. One could argue that the reduction in Bifidobacterium is due to the elimination of dairy. Perhaps. However, the most studied prebiotic is inulin, and the positive association between inulin and Bifidobacterium has been proven concretely. In low FODMAPs, inulin is eliminated most notably in artichoke, asparagus, garlic, and the onion family. Not only does Bifidobacterium love inulin for its fuel, but so does Fecalibacterium prausiciae, which has been shown in a number of studies. Additionally, F. prausiciae uses apple pectin for its fuel. Those are the two preferred fuel sources for F. prausiciae, which is at the top of the superhero list in the gut. Reducing it is a bad idea. Here are all of the published studies I could find over the years which analyze the microbiome changes in the low FODMAPS diet. As you can see in the column labeled decreased, Bifidobacterium and F. prausiciae come up frequently. F. prausiciae is within the family Ruminococcaceae, at least until recently. So when you see a significant decrease in this family, also known as Clostridium cluster 4, a great many health promoting taxa have been reduced likely to include F. prausiciae. Also a bad thing is when you see a reduction in what's labeled Roman numeral 14a. That's also known as Lactospiraceae, the other main family which is full of health-promoting taxa. What you also need to know 
is many of these studies are very limited in scope. In performing PCR, which was used in five of these studies, they are only looking at a very small specific number of bacteria. For example, in the first row, they only use primers for three bacteria. So they have no data points on over 1,000 other species. What other health-promoting bacteria were reduced in these five studies that we don't know about? This is a slide you'll see often in my presentations. This is the culmination of thousands of hours of work determining the key players in the microbiome. Collected here are the great universal or almost universal health-promoting taxa of the gut, recently reclassified within the order Eubacterialis. The darker the green, the stronger the data as a health promoter. Out of a thousand or more species in your gut, this handful plays an enormous role in your health. Some of these names are familiar to you by now, as they were in our previous slides. These health-promoting bacteria have been found to be consistently, significantly higher in healthier cohorts, and significantly lower in unhealthy ones across all diseases I've analyzed. Nowhere else will you find this data. These incredible bacteria listed here can occupy a lot of real estate and perform many health-promoting functions beyond the highly beneficial one of butyrate production. So, which of these have been shown to be significantly reduced in the low FODMAPs diet? Well, let's see. How about the whole family Ruminococcaceae? And more specifically within that family, the species F. parasitia. Also reduced is the whole family Lacnospiraceae, and more specifically, the genus Roseburia. And let's not forget the health-promoting genus Bifidobacterium, which resides in another phylum, or Acromancia mucinophila, which has been shown to be beneficial in IBS, although in some conditions it's a potential concern. And I'm not the only one cautioning on this. From this paper, and I quote, current data suggests that the low FODMAP diet may effectively improve clinical outcomes in the management of IBD and ensure better quality of life for IBD patients. However, there is evidence highlighting some issues of concern, particularly the adequacy of the diet and the impact on the gut microbiota. Or from this paper, and I quote, in general, similar to healthy subjects, restricting non-digestible carbohydrate intake in patients with intestinal diseases has opposite effects compared to prebiotic supplementation, causing a reduction in bifidobacteria and an increase in bacteria associated with dysbiosis. And one more for good measure. Quote, however, in conjunction with the beneficial clinical impact, recent studies have also demonstrated that the low FODMAP diet leads to profound changes in the microbiota and the metabolism, the duration and clinical relevance of which are yet unknown. So what should you do? Well, as we discussed, you can start by going dairy-free and possibly gluten-free as well. In fact, in this four-week trial here, where 99 subjects completed the study, going only gluten-free actually slightly outperformed low FODMAPs in regards to the resolution of IBS symptoms. So if you're looking for symptom resolution, why go crazy throwing so many healthy foods aside where you can just eliminate dairy and gluten and get the same results or better? Now I know each person reacts differently to foods. You know your body best. It's up to you to custom tailor the food avoidance part. However, food avoidance does not get you to the root of the problem. It alleviates bothersome symptoms. And it calms down the immune system, at least for a while, until it leads you down a path of more food and avoidance. You have to address the root cause, the microbiome, which in turn will rectify immunological issues. Here's more food intolerance information. Some of these foods will likely make your list. As we can see here in this study of 200 patients with IBS, most food intolerances were due to dairy products or wheat. Other top scorers were based on histamine release, such as coffee, chocolate, and citrus, which are related to an already ramped up immune response, not a core driver of inflammation. And you see onions scoring high due to their high inulin content. And you might say, wait a minute, you just said inulin is a good thing, as it feeds many great bacteria. Yes, but there's a caveat. Here we have one of my favorite papers of all time, which teaches an excellent lesson. This tackles an incredibly important concept within the gut environment, that of pH. These researchers used four different levels of acidity, 
in a controlled in vitro environment to measure the growth of various bacteria using the common prebiotics, inulin and pectin, two of the prebiotics I recommend. At varying levels of acidity, different bacteria can outcompete others. They state that, quote, at pH levels closer to neutrality, our evidence suggests that other bacteria will tend to outcompete bifidobacterium for inulin. Now we know that bifidobacterium loves inulin, but we also know that there are other bacteria, some of whom are more or less neutral bystanders, while others are bad actors, possess the same enzymatic machinery to also degrade inulin or other prebiotics and use it for themselves. It's not just the good guys who consume prebiotics. Although on average, the health-promoting taxa favor these substrates, while the opportunistic pathogens tend to favor others. At higher pH levels, the good guys get outcompeted. For example, in the second to last point, eubacterium rectale, which is incredibly beneficial, appears to be inactive and outcompeted by bacteroides at a pH of 6.7, but it is very happy at a pH of 5.5. I can guarantee that the luminal environment of the dysbiotic gut has a higher pH than it should. And going back to onions, if you ingest a small amount of inulin or any prebiotic into this environment, the bad actors can outcompete the good guys and use it for fuel. Hence the symptoms. Now some prebiotic will feed the good guys, which can also induce symptoms as there is a war going on for real estate in your gut. So you have to intelligently drive a significant shift in your microbiome, one that favors the health promoters. And who are these health promoters and who are they doing battle with? First, let me explain this slide. On the bottom, the x-axis, you see the keystone taxa, which largely determine the microbiome profile in IBS slash diarrhea slash constipation. Green indicates that the taxon was found to be significantly higher in the healthy controls, a good thing. The orange color indicates that the taxon was significantly higher in the IBS subjects, a bad thing. The y-axis indicates the number of original research papers where a given taxon was found to be significantly different. When I compile all the data from the 54 IBS studies I used and highlight the taxa which stand out the most, we get this chart here. You'll find this data nowhere else. What you see here is the average microbiome profile for IBS with taxa such as Fecalibacterium prasitii, Odoribacter, Allostypes, and Bifidobacterium really standing out as healthy, whereas classic opportunistic pathogens in orange are consistently, significantly higher in IBS. The green arrows show four of the taxa which are reduced by the low FODMAPs diet, which we covered earlier. You can see that these four taxa are consistently, significantly higher in healthy controls or conversely, consistently significantly lower in IBS subjects. So if these health-promoting taxa are already low in IBS subjects, why would we want to lower them even further with a low FODMAP diet? We don't. Also note lactobacillus highlighted with the orange arrow. Most of its IBS data matches that of the bad actors. And yet millions of people take it as a probiotic and attempt to help with IBS. And if you think this data is just an anomaly, solely associated with IBS, you're wrong. The data for lactobacillus across the board is very ugly. It has the profile of an opportunistic pathogen. More on this in many other presentations. Let's focus in on the number one superhero of the gut, Fecalibacterium prositii. Green is still good news and orange is still bad news. Now our x-axis represents all the conditions I've analyzed over the years. Again, only human data, no animal data. These are all original research articles, no reviews. As you can see, when a significant difference is found in a study for F. prositii between healthy controls and subjects from a given condition, almost always it is higher in the healthy controls, shown in green. Given the inexact science of the microbiome, this is incredibly consistent. Here, association does equal causation. I have a whole webinar developed to F. prositii where you can learn more. No other taxon in the microbiome has this much consistent positive data. Some come close, like the amazing genus Roseburia, but F. prositii is the gold standard. So why in the world would you want to take out 
of your diet, inulin and apple peptin, it's two substrates of choice. Maybe there's something to the proverb, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Okay, so you want to resolve your IBS or constipation or diarrhea. And you've now learned that you don't need a radical diet which cuts out some of very nutritious foods and eliminates a number of key prebiotics. You're aware that you can make significant symptomological progress by avoiding dairy and gluten. But what do you do to address the root cause, the imbalance in your microbiome? For this, I refer you to my presentation on IBS. I hope you learned a thing or two from this free presentation. It's a great example of what you'll see if you join my Microbiome University. I have 50 in-depth presentations on deck highlighting every conceivable topic about the microbiome. I'll launch a new Microbiome University presentation each Monday morning, and each Thursday evening, I'll have a large free group webinar for those with questions about the presentation of the week. So join now.